my name is Ricky Snyder and I practice law um, and as um, Martha mentioned um, the firm is Snyder Law Group uh, we're in association with Pritchett uh, and Snyder and uh, and practice law in the areas of uh, litigation primarily. Litigation in any arena, uh, whether it be um, administrative um, hearings or litigation in state courts, uh, state district courts, federal court, uh, OSHA, uh, let's see, EEO, uh, EPA, uh, DEQ, I can name off all these different um, uh, agencies that you, all everyone here knows. Um, and we um, are, represent our clients before these agencies and um, anything else that they need that they get involved in that they didn't know that they would get involved in and so they call and ask us and we just simply uh, jump right in and, and handle it. And um, so whether they think um, uh, they have a problem or not, we look with them, work with them, and see if they do, and and see what problems they have. Um, and it just it is just a wide array of issues that we deal with um, on a daily basis. And so uh, Victoria had asked me, I think it was uh, last year, to uh, to speak to this group, and I did. And and now I'm working with um, one of the uh, graduates of the program, and so she's uh, received contracts uh, uh, with Tinker Air Force Base. And she had called me back in the fall, and she was working on that and and she was getting together her team and went through the uh, program and she she did it and she's uh, she I could I could tell that she was going to do it when I spoke at the last conference that we had because she um, she was very engaged and and I could just I could I could see her and when she phoned and we met then I knew she was the one that I had seen and I could point out in 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 the room so it's kind of interesting and it goes back to a, a phrase that I learned in raising kids, if you think you can or if you think you can't, you're right. And so, and so if you, and if you uh, think you're going to learn something here or if you think you're not and it's a waste of your time, either way, you're right. And you may already know <laughs> more than I do and I really learn a lot and I learn as much from the people that I'm teaching as they learn from me, but hopefully then you'll walk out of here with more than you started out with. So I'm very excited to be here with you this morning and um, I hope we can have a great exchange and communicate and that that you can all learn from this. Now in the outline that I have, let's see, um, we start out with, uh, what is a contract? And I have some materials and I, I I looked at that and I thought I would start with what is not a contract and um, and that you would generally have ideas of what you think a contract is and is not and in I don't know your materials and I don't know if I have a copy of those with me but we're going to talk about contracts for a moment um, and you run into contracts daily and um, contracts are like um, I would say um, think um, like like a television set. They have certain components, uh, or like a radio, or like a car. They have they have certain components. We call those com components elements or elements to a contract. And as far as any type of a legal document, a contract is probably the most easy document that you could define, and uh, it's very easy and we know in law what constitute a contract and we deal with those a lot as far as sometimes we deal with subscription agreements, um, sometimes we deal with contracts of employment, uh, we deal with uh, contracts to perform a service, uh, contracts certainly ODOT uh, deals with contracts and contracts as far as the basics of a contract they have uh, certain elements. First we have to have an offer. Now someone is not going to provide an offer to another to do that service, perform that service, if we're talking about service contracts, unless they know that person. So that's first and foremost. They have to know who you are, what you do, what you can provide um, in order to obtain that offer to perform those services. So number one on contracts we have the offer. 
And an offer could be a written offer, could be a verbal offer. Verbal offer would usually start out first. So we have, we have an offer. And um, a verbal offer is, it might be a preliminary invitation uh, to speak and to meet and discuss the potential or what you can do for that other entity uh, in order to get the written contract. Because a verbal offer and a verbal contract is worth the paper that it's written on, which is nothing. Because it's not written on paper, it's verbal. So, so, an, so our, our contract starts out with an offer, and it's an offer to perform services. It's an agreement that you enter into voluntarily when you enter into a contract. You have two or more people, you may have many, that are entering into this contract, and they start out, like I said, with an offer. The next step is the acceptance of the offer. You have to have consideration for the offer. This is just a broad overview, and then I'll go into those specifically. And then you have, uh, you have the performance of the contract. Um, we have specific performance uh, of, co of a contract and then we have, that's where we get into bonds and that, those bonding issues at the very end. Um, but first we have to have the offer. And, okay. The most important feature of the contract, and I want to make sure I don't leave anything out of this, is that when one party makes an offer for an arrangement that another accepts, this can be called a concurrence of wills or a consensus of two or more parties. It, the obvious obje objection is that the court cannot read two minds and the existence or otherwise of an agreement between the parties is judged objectively. And what that is to say is, um, as my partner always says, good agreements make or make good fences. Good, and you have what you have is an agreement between parties that you can lay out in black and white, such as this might be a contract. It has different elements in the contract. It's objective. It's read. Everyone knows what we're talking about. And we don't have to say, well, Andy said, or Martha said, Victoria said, Mike, right? Mike, Mike said. We don't have to worry about what someone said. We know what the contract or the agreement was, was is because it was put into writing. Now, uh, when this uh, individual that I worked with last year, when she got involved in her contract, say for example with uh, with Tinker or someone has a contract um, that they're dealing with with ODOT, uh, we look at what we call the four corners of the document, and we have this document that is in writing, this contract, and we look at each individual section of that contract and in that contract we also put in what we call boilerplate language which says that if one part of the contract is found to be void it shall not void the other remaining parts of the contract. So contracts um, come in like I said various forms you've all seen them. Um, you, you buy a car you have a contract. You rent a house you uh, have a contract. You buy a house you have a contract. Um, you, uh, you see on that contract certain elements that you can probably think and, and recall and see. Uh, you have a surgical procedure, you, saw, you have a contract, usually for that surgical procedure. And contracts have certain elements um, in addition to this offer acceptance and consideration. Always, always, you'll find a date and that, dates, that date may or may not be important. It may have certain uh, issues concerning whether it was December 31st or January 1st. It may have a difference if it's October 31st or November 1st. A lot of our statutes change on November 1st historically, so we may have differences as to when that contract is signed. So those dates can be very important, even, w even whether it's dated or not. I mean, you really need to watch uh, undated 
contracts and and I see those and and if someone wants to put a different date in the contract than what you know the date to be you need to watch that um, signatures on contracts are important you want to make sure that the parties sign and their signature a lot of people will ask um, whether they need to sign their full name I get this a lot whether they need to sign their their uh, if it's Ricky R. Snyder, or if I need to put my middle name, Ricky Renee Snyder, um, it really, it's your signature. It doesn't matter how you sign uh, your name, your signature is your signature because underneath my signature, it's going to say Ricky R. Snyder. And so the, na the signature above that signature block is going to be my signature. So it doesn't matter. Um, I, I sign credit cards, by the way, differently than I sign um, any other legal document, and that is because um, if that ever comes up and it comes into question, then no, I will know whether I sign that credit card slip or not because that signature on my credit card is different than the signature on any contract or legal document. So I will, and no one will know what that is because I, I'm the only one that knows what it is and I will know if it's my signature or not, particularly on that, on that American Express charge. So, but on the other one, we will always know what your, um, yeah, that you've signed it. So you don't have to worry about whether or not you're signing it. Um, and is it Andrew? Yes, yes. so, so, so and, and Andy doesn't have to sign Andrew, P Andrew, middle initial penny the third or fifth or whatever he can sign his name however he wants to sign his name and that's his signature okay on that contract um, but you want to make sure that the parties that you're dealing with are the parties that are supposed to be signing the contract and that have the authority to act on behalf of that entity um, you uh, really want to understand who you're working with and make sure that um, that if they don't have the authority that you get the people in there that you have the authority. Don't waste your time or their time by dealing with others that don't have the authority to act to make this offer to you. Now, I've seen people who have had offers made, um, verbal offers, and they don't go anywhere because they don't take the next steps and they don't, they really don't push through the process to get to the people that they need to speak to to get a firm offer to do business. So. Uh, you want to get to that level in that playing arena to that person or entity, that person within that entity that can make that offer to you, the one that has the authority, the authority to act. And these offers and the acceptance and the agreement can take some time. And I think that um, when I last, when we last visited, that was June, and uh, she uh, finalized that contract in, I think we just did that last week. And um, so uh, that so uh, patience is also part of that process with with the offer. So she worked to get that offer, and she um, she the acceptance is another form of it. If someone makes an offer in contract law, and I someone makes an offer to me, and I don't accept that offer, and they say, for example. Um, Ricky, will you agree to perform this service uh, for us for fifty thousand uh, dollars by June thirtieth, two thousand thirteen? And I say, well, I can uh, not perform this service, but I'll do uh, forty percent of what you've asked for for the same amount of money, the fifty thousand dollars by um, May thirty first. Uh, that is not an acceptance of the offer, obviously, because I didn't, uh, I didn't accept what they offered. Instead, that's what we call a counter offer. So when I made the counter offer to the offer, that is that voids that it negates and voids that that first offer is off the table. So, and I have seen people who have said, okay she doesn't want to do business or that person doesn't want to do business they've never said that about me but that person doesn't want to do business it can happen in any arena it can happen uh, like I said uh, buying a house buying a car in any area where someone makes an offer and you make a counter offer it can uh, voids the first offer because you've made a second offer and they they can take that offer off the table and start again with a new offer now um, 
they can say then, well, if you can't do this, you know, this is your counter offer, then what we want you to do is we could have you complete these services by June 30th uh, or May 31st, um, and they could offer other terms. And I could accept that. And I would accept that offer. Generally, we're talking about doing this is all oral. We're all talking, we're all having a meeting, and we're all coming to terms with what we can do with the, the offer that they've made and the acceptance. Uh, but then we talk about the next element of the offer after acceptance. We have consideration. This okay, so um, let's say uh, Martha makes an offer to me, then I accept the offer and to perform services by June thirtieth. And then we put this on paper. We've got a date. Martha signs, I sign, and we're finished, right? No, no. Well, we're, we're lacking something. Does you, can you think about what we might be lacking? If Martha and I do what I just said, and she's made this offer and I've accepted, and I'm going to do something, perform some service by June 30th, then if I don't perform it by June 30th, then what's Martha going to do? Well, she's, what does she have, what does she have that's causing me to do anything by June 30th? One, in most cases, is money, the, the almighty dollar. We want payment for our services that we're going to do by June 30th. If we don't have payment and I don't do what I said I was going to do by June 30th, then I just I simply don't do it. And Martha says to her supervisor, well, I talked to, uh, talk, talk to Ricky, and Ricky said that she was going to do this by June 30th, and she hasn't done anything, and when I didn't do anything, what did I lose? So, so we've tipped the scales of justice, we've tipped the, the playing field, if you will, so that I don't have to do anything. Um, instead, after, after Martha got this acceptance by me to perform these services, let's say Victoria didn't come up the next day and say, hey, Ricky, I've got this, um, this uh, uh, project that I need to do and I need, I need it completed by June 30th, and if you would please, it would be great if I could get you to do this, and uh, I need you to do this, this, and this by June 30th, and I will pay you $100,000. And it's the same thing, and it's during the same time period. Well, what do you think that I want to do? Do you think I want to work with Martha or with Victoria? That's, not, that's really, there's no question, I'm going to want to do the same job for this, during the same time period for $100,000 rather than the $50,000. I'm no dummy, no, neither are you. So, so what, what's going to protect Martha in getting me to do those services is the contract and the contract for the performance of those services that she wants. Otherwise, I'm going to go over here and I'm going to sign that agreement with Victoria, and uh, and she's going to ha say that I'm she's going to pay me. We have to have that element of that contract that can that's called the consideration. The consideration is the money. Otherwise, uh, there, we don't have anything. I just walk away. Uh, the good news is, is that if I didn't do it, uh, I didn't do it right, and there's no money. Well, Martha is not on the hook to pay me any of that fifty thousand dollars. But the bad news is, is that I'm not going to do it because there's no consideration for me to do it. There's nothing causing me to perform those services. So consideration is a, it's a very difficult um, uh, item to understand un 
unless you're talking about money. If you're talking about consideration, we talk about things all the time as far as contract and contract agreements that we're entering into with other people and whether there was any consideration for that agreement that they entered into. And many times there is no consideration and if there's no consideration, there is no agreement. So you have to, the consideration in a way, you have to think about what makes someone want to perform the services or perform in that contract, and it's the consideration. And so we have an offer. You might have the counter offer. And in some cases, and I'm not just saying that if you don't like the terms and you don't like the offer and it's not going to, to work and you say, okay, well, uh, Victoria or Martha, I can't do it by June, June 30th, I can do it by July 31st, and that's a counteroffer. And they say, well, July 31st isn't going to work because these people need this by, they really need it by, um, you know, July 21st, and so, you know, we would have to have this performed by you by no later than July 15th, and I say, I can do that, I can, I can do that, I can do July 15th that'll work. I, I say that and we come to an understanding, well if you can do it by July 15th, they really need it by July 21st, that would work for everyone if you can do it by July 15th. Now, that would probably make Martha and Victoria, Andy, anyone in this room a little bit more nervous because now you don't have that three weeks built into, you know, just as time flies and we're not having fun and things just don't work like we're expecting them to work, well then we want to make sure that we have that extra built-in time, especially when we're talking about ODOT and we're talking about weather and we're talking about other factors. I mean, that's, that's built into, um, into time. Um, but uh, that's, that kind of a counter offer is not going to cause you not to get a contract. I mean, it's simply talking about it. I have seen other people that in, in the legal arena where I play and work every day, uh, if someone rejects an offer, they may very well reject an offer and there may not be a counter offer. And you see this all the time, is this your, is this your final offer? And I've worked with um, the Supreme Court um, in negotiating cases and mediations with Supreme Court um, former Supreme Court justices that now do mediations and in the end they'll say is this all the money that you have is this the final offer that you want to make to settle this case and I've had I've been asked you know is this if, if this isn't uh, now would be the time to offer everything you have and my response has been yeah but I want to have just a little bit you know back in my you know arsenal here to settle this case if I need it and I've been told this is the time to offer everything you've had you have and and it's it's a it's a real uh, it's a difficult moment when you offer everything you have knowing that you have not a penny more and that you can't get a penny more but this is this all is all you have and they can take it or leave it and you really want to settle this case in those cases that can be the final offer if I said I've got uh, $250,000 to settle a case and they say $250,001 no deal and we can walk away and walk out the door and take that $250,000 with us and go nowhere so yes you can kill a deal without accepting the original offer and in your negotiations when you finally get to the very end you can you can kill a deal. Also, in your offer and acceptance portion when you're trying to get this contract, if you talk and you give them indicators that, the other party indicators that you can't perform, then they may withdraw the offer, not because you made a counter offer, but because you gave them information that indicates that you, uh, don't really, it's not that you don't like the terms of the contract, but that you can't perform the contract as they're trying to get you to do so. And you may have limitations that you don't want to share and that you're not uh, providing to them, but they may sense that and they may pick up on that and you might not get the contract simply, not because you made a counter offer. They may say that you made a counter offer and that's why you didn't get the contract, but it will really be because in some sense 
they understood or believed that you couldn't perform the contract, you couldn't do what they wanted you to do, and you gave them that, indi that those indicators were there, and then they decided that the, another party might provide a better service to them than you could do so. So in that respect, perhaps, it might be better to, uh, to limit your talking, however, if you don't believe that you can perform a contract to the satisfaction of the other party, my best advice would be not to enter into the contract. Um, because you uh, don't want to um, over-promise and under-deliver. You want to do just the opposite. You want to under-promise and over-deliver. And uh, you really don't want to set yourself up for failure. So if you think that you can, as I said, or you think that you can't, you're right. So if you don't think that you can do this, it would be best to say, well, in this instance, this, this service or what you want me to do in this, in this particular phase is not something that I feel comfortable doing. And then you might get into a di dialogue as to why that is. And and discover that they have someone else that can perform that part of the contract or that service that you can't. And so it, that may not even kill the deal. But it is better to say, you know, I really haven't had any experience in this, in this area and, um, and uh, if uh, I, could only talk to you about this or I could work with you at a later date, that would be fine and they enter into a discussion with you and find out really that you can do it in some, your performance of your contract in some other arena, some other time, some other date, just not this time, that would be uh, better than trying to perform a contract and failing because um, uh, you really will set yourself up for future, well, you won't get any offers in the future. It may um, really do damage to your reputation throughout the community in which you're working, and so you really you don't want to do what you think you can't do. Um, for example, in many instances with many, um, in the past with many uh, employers, for example, um, I've talked to them and they've said, okay, well, do you have experience in this? And my response would be no. No, I don't. Uh, and well, what about this? No, no, I haven't done this. But you have done this. And I've said, yes, I've done this, but I haven't done this. And they continue on, and it's, it's odd that I've walked out of, out of different job interviews over the past few years where I, I, I am, I, you hear about puff and you know I can do this and I can do this and I can do this and you want the job so badly that people puff and they they exaggerate their qualifications to do some kind of job what I had done in the past and I haven't done been in that position for many years but in the past I have not in any way puffed or exaggerated my uh, credentials or abilities uh, quite the opposite yeah, I'm very very honest and forthright about what I can do and about what I cannot do. And with that, um, in the end, it's surprising it, that if you really are honest and candid with people that they want to help you and they want to work with you and they want to find a way to get you into their organization so that you can do work with them and you have been honest and forthright and forthcoming with what you can and can't do. And so they want to find someone else to say, well, we have someone over here, another um, subcontractor or some other party or entity that can perform that, that service. And so we'll let them perform that component and can you do the rest? And so if you can, then you said that you can and you enter into that agreement in that way. Now, just because someone provides you with a contract, let's say this is a, a contract, and I, this is a very small contract, by the way. Um, mm, let's see, it's about, I'll tell you, mm, about 25 pages. So this is, a, this is not a very long contract, um, but 
someone puts something in here on page, say, 17, and I don't like it. Well, if I don't like that portion of the contract and I look at that and I read that and I want to change that, uh, just because this has been written doesn't mean that it can't be changed. And in this day of computer technology, you know that it can be changed within five minutes, as long as it takes to type it and reprint. So if you, or, or if you don't like what it says, it's not uncommon to, you know, you can line through that portion of a contract if both parties agree and initial it and both parties agree and then you have eliminated that portion of the contract or you might change that portion of the contract or the contract might even have um, it's possible that it has the wrong county it's possible that it has the wrong city it's possible that it has the wrong state it's possible that so many things could be wrong in the contract I have seen so many um, glaring errors in contracts that it would it would simply it would shock you I have seen errors in orders signed by the court and uh, people people don't read people don't take the time to read they don't take the time to spell check they don't take the time to really sit down and look they just don't take the time we're all doing more work with less time and so we're not paying attention to the details uh, simply put, we're not dotting the I's, crossing the T's, and you really need to sit down and read. Very simple. Read. It takes time. It, it, it takes a lot of time. But if it's worth doing, it's worth your time in reading and seeing if these contract provisions uh, are the provisions that you want. If they are not the provisions that you want, then you simply stop and you go back to the person and you say, well, let's review this portion of the contract. I don't understand what this means. And it may simply mean that it needs some kind of alteration or you didn't understand it and it was right from the beginning. But whatever, if you don't understand something, some part of the contract, ask for an explanation. Ask and see if it needs to be uh, rewritten, that portion of it. And it may be something that is, is, is hard and fast uh, and it just and it needs to be signed, and um, and when I was looking at this this contract last week, yes, it had um, it had it had typographical errors, it had um, uh, had um, location errors, it had many errors that were that were in contained in this contract, and uh, I. I listed those errors and and got on the phone and and to the party that created this contract so that they could make these changes so that the contract would be corrected. There were also um, you need to have in your contract that portion. What what do you do? Uh, when does the contract terminate? When, what is the end date? In this particular contract that I'm referring to, uh, these dates for the performance of this contract conflicted. In one portion of the contract, it said one thing, and another portion of the contract, it said another. And so I said, well, and I explained that we really needed to define this. And, in, and when you're talking about someone who's entering into a contract, perhaps for the first time, they want that contract badly. And sometimes to their detriment, because they won't be able to perform, because they know that, say, for example, it's going to be a six month or 180 days to complete that contract, and they put 100. 80 days on page 4, but on page 12, they put 60 days or 90 days. And so they have different dates for completion of the contract, and so we really don't know if all, everyone got together on it. And to be totally candid, in the beginning document, that's when we need to have that spelled out so that all of us are on the same page, no pun intended, but we all know what we're talking about within the time frame that we're talking about and that we're all reading. and. Uh, uh, I, I picked up on it immediately. Another attorney in my office um, had looked at it as well. He found it. He said, well, there's some problems in this contract. And I said, yes, there were. There were um, paragraph um, uh, changes. In other words, paragraphs were out of place. Like I said, there were typos. Um, and so, if, you know, if you really want to do it, you want to do it right. But like I also said, in uh, in the practice of law, I the week before I was working on an order. Someone else had an, an order. It was about to be filed with the court, and I corrected the order. The 
order was fraught with you know, misspellings and I didn't understand the order and if I didn't understand the order I didn't know how anyone else was going to understand the order so it's not um, I, I, we see it everywhere and we see it with with um, in all in all areas whether it's in uh, just in contracting or with services with ODOT but in all areas but this is the document of the contract that you have that is going to be your playbook it's going to tell you what you need to do when you need to do it it's going to have what the offer was, what the acceptance was, what you're expected to do, and, and for how much and the time period that you're, you're needing to do it. And specifically, it's going to have the job that you're supposed to do. And when you're looking at the contract, you need to make sure that those performance portions of that contract are exactly what you want them to be or what you understand them to be. If they're not exactly what you expect them to be, then you need to, that's where you need to put changes into that contract. If you don't, and we don't have a clear understanding of what that contract should contain, later when you get into the legal arena, if you should, that's where we're going to have problems because the only thing that we can go by is what is in this document. Um, I can't say, well, you know, uh, she had 188 days, to, 180 days to perform that contract. Over here it says, they say over here it says 90. So it wasn't performed within the 90 days, therefore she didn't perform the contract. And that would be true. We, we, would, we would have to argue. Uh, over that issue, but we wouldn't have had to argue over that issue if we had the contract read and completed properly to begin with. And so we call that executing the contract. So we have the offer, the acceptance, and the consideration. And in that contract, we have, we date it, we sign it, we have the terms and those duties, and if you can think of some of those duties, right here right now that are contained in that contract that's where you really want to particularly look to see if you can perform those duties that are expected of you in that contract if they are not that's where you want to stop and say no I can't do this I I can do A B C D E G but I can't do F F, if is not what I understood that you wanted me to do, I understood that you wanted me to do these other elements. And also, by the way, I don't see I in here, J, K, L, M, N, O, P. I don't see these, but I can't do F. So you really, you need to be very, very specific on what you can and can't do. Any questions? Any duties that you have seen that are vague. No? Okay. Well, watch the duties that you're per to perform and see if those duties are vague and they may be intentionally vague, but you may and you may want them to be vague. It gives you some wiggle room. Or you may want them to be very specific. And but either way, whatever you want needs to be in that contract and that's your time to get in to stone or on paper as we will the contract. Now like I said, if afterwards you are into this contract, you have the offer, the acceptance, the consideration, you've entered into the contract, you've got the dates, the signatures, we have the, the amount, and the contract is executed and you are to begin work, let's say, on February 1st. Something happens and so now we need to change the contract and we aren't going to be able to begin work until March 1st. That could be a problem either on your end or the other party's end. But in any event, if there is a change in that contract that changes something material, that would be the date or the money or could be uh, even the termination or how long that contract's supposed to last, we need to put that in writing as well. It would be an addendum to the contract. You wouldn't have to redo the contract. But anything that alters that contract needs to be put in writing. Uh, it can't be, well, you know, I talked to Greg. Right? I talked to Greg, and Greg said, Mike said, that when Mike talked to Victoria, Victoria said it would be okay if Martha said it was okay after she talked to Andy. 
Okay, did you get all that? And so um, now we have to go, we have five people right there that are going to have to talk about whether it's okay to, to move the date of starting this performance of this contract from February 1st to March 1st. And then we don't know, now we're hanging between February 1st and March 1st, and we don't know whether we have something firm in writing. And we really need to know by this date, uh, January 17th, right? This is January 17th. Okay, we need to know about right now whether we're going to start on February 1st or March 1st, and it would be nice to have that in writing in some kind of format so that we could uh, uh, at least plan our schedule and have something that we could go back on because really if we can't start on March 1st, then with the job that I was going to start with, with um, was it Martha first or was it Victoria first? I don't remember because I don't have it in writing. But in either event, I might decide that if I couldn't start that contract on February 1st, then I might want to go with the other contract that was going to pay me $50,000 or more and go back to that first person and try to do that. I might want to do that. But if I was on the other side, I might have a provision that had a, an out clause for me that said if the beginning of this contract cannot be started on or about, that's what we put that on or about date, on or about February 1st, then, and it starts within a reasonable time thereafter, reasonable meaning, we'll talk about reasonable in a minute, reasonable time thereafter, then the performance of that contract will still be met by that person contracting with us to do that job. Um, so whether February 1st to March 1st is a reasonable time or not depends upon what we call the reasonable man theory. That's where we women, um, we just defer to the men and we decide that all men are reasonable and whatever they say is reasonable is going to be reasonable and we call and really and truly it is called the reasonable man theory. And so what is reasonable <laughs> is reasonable and so if it's reasonable to wait one month to start that contract then it's reasonable and we would put that provision in there and then we might argue about that later but I, it really might cause some difficulties, as you can see. You see that a lot um, in certain areas um, where someone can't perform the next contract because the first contract was delayed. And so then that may keep them, it, it has kind of a domino effect down the road. So uh, you, there are provisions in there. Uh, Well-written contracts have all those provisions so that uh, if there's a delay in the beginning of that project, that's covered. Um, if there's a delay at the end of the contract, that's covered. We have delays due to weather. We have delays due to um, you know unexpected consequences, acts of God, um, you know different um, unforeseen uh, natural disasters um, that may affect the performance of that contract, and those are all included in that contract. Now, um, I saw in a contract about six months ago. Uh, the uh, the provision that said that payment on the contract would be made monthly once an acceptable invoice was submitted, and I thought, well, okay, what is an acceptable invoice? What exact what what that word acceptable? What I don't understand what that word means. So I, st I immediately I stop, and I get to that word. I, and I that's highlighted, and I don't know what acceptable means now. Mind you, someone really wants, to, they want this contract, they want to sign this contract, they want to get busy on this contract because, you know, th these are uh, times where we all want to work, we all want to get paid, so we just, we just want to sign. But after you've done this work and you're supposed to complete this work and you're supposed to get paid for this work and you are expecting to be paid for this work, what if you don't have an acceptable invoice to be paid for the work? And what is an acceptable invoice? invoice. I don't know. I can't know what an acceptable invoice is. And I can tell you for as many people as I represent, they all, everyone, ha they all have different invoicing procedures, different invoicing formats. They all have different invoicing time frames. Um, different uh, matters um, just dictate simply different ways of payment. But if I don't know those ways and I can't submit it the way they need it to be submitted, then I can't get paid for the work that I do. 
So I have to find out first and foremost what that acceptable invoice is. And if that language is in there, um, then you need to find out what that acceptable invoice is. And if it has to be in a certain format, um, then it ne you need to find out what that is. On the other end, though, if it's something that you are preparing for someone to perform services for you and you want it in a certain format, well, then it would behoove you to provide that to them uh, so that they, so you can help them get that into the invoice format that they need because assuming that they know is not going to work and uh, let's say that they do not just a good job or a great job but an extraordinary job and you want them back again but they didn't send their invoice in the acceptable format and that's not going to work for you and it may not just work for you personally we're not talking about you as in a just personally it may not work for your organization and so you need to bounce that back so that they can put it in the correct format and that's only going to delay payment to them they're not going to be happy they may not want to work for you in the future but you may want their work because what they do for you is so extraordinary that they can do it fast they finished ahead of time it was not just good it was great it was extraordinary and you want them back but they don't want to come back if they're not going to be paid and so we need to make sure that everyone understands and so and oftentimes when we're dealing with people and we've been dealing with them for so long we make assumptions and it's easy to make assumptions we all do that and we assume that people know what we're talking about we assume that they know what these contracts look like we assume that they know what invoicing is we assume that they know that uh, invoices have to be in a certain format and we want those invoices in a certain format because we need to send those on up for payment and we don't want to look bad and we don't want someone breathing down our necks to say well didn't you tell them that it had to be in a certain format and didn't you tell them that it had to be this way well you're just going to have to kick it back and then you have to go back to this uh, service provider and have them redo this invoice and no one's happy so you want to make sure that that anything that uh, you need to cover up front needs to be covered up front and a lot of times what we do what I do in my office we have checklists for everything and uh, and, it, and it works and so you know and if you skip something it's it will come back and it will haunt you and mm -hmm. and and so you just you don't want to make assumptions even it's sort of like um, uh, I just hate to make such a very simplistic it is very simplistic um, uh, example but if you go in and it for for women we'll get the women in here now if you go in and you want to get a haircut and you've been getting a haircut f with the same person for the last 15 years it never hurts to go over as I do every time the same thing that I want I don't want to assume that just because this person's been doing it for 15 years they know what to do today because I don't know how many people they've seen in the last four weeks or six weeks or eight weeks whatever I don't want to assume that so you need to go down through each step and I do and each time so even something as simplistic as that and so and I make sure I when I'm talking to people that I deal with court reporters other attorneys I don't want to assume that they know what I want or what I need I go through the basics every time um, and it's redundant which means it is very very uh, uh, it's boring it's hard and no one really wants to hear it and you'll hear people say I know I know I know I know I know and I know and you say but I have to go over this with you just to make sure you know because really they may have forgotten something themselves if they've done business with you for a long time and they may simply skip over something and you had no idea that that was even a possibility so uh, contracts um, we have um, um, books um, we have statutes we have case law on the interpretation of contracts we study contracts in law school and um, it's just it's we have contracts one we have contracts two and we study and study and study contracts we have we have months over offer just the term offer we have months over acceptance we have months over what is consideration we have months that we study 
all of this. And so in a short amount of time, it's hard to, to give you all of those, those ins and outs when we've gone over it, like I have, over the years and months. And then when I'm talking about offer acceptance consideration and going over it in school, I'm talking about one thing only that we're going over, and that's books. And books are not contracts. So we're actually reading about contracts, but we're not looking at contracts. We're not writing contracts. And so we're not dealing with the real world. We're dealing with what we find in a book. So that's, that's completely different. So when I've worked with, like I said, this, this great success story uh, just recently, um, she um, really uh, came to me, uh, I want to say back in, I want to say August. It may have been in August, and she was getting everything lined up for herself, and she said that she was going to have contracts that she needed to have reviewed and she wanted to know if I would review those for her and work with her that she was assembling her team so that those people could look over her contracts and uh, I've got to say that I was I was so impressed I was impressed when I saw her last time that I was speaking and I was so impressed with what she did and just in sitting down and talking to her I mean I was uh, truly amazed that she had the, the sensibility and the senses within herself and the knowledge to know that she needed to assemble this team and to have these people in her arsenal so that she could come back and, uh, and, and succeed. And I knew, I knew back in August that she would. I had no doubt because she, you could just see it. You, I could see it in June and I could pick her out of a group. I could see her in August and I thought, She's going to have that contract. I knew it, and it's very, it's contagious. And uh, as much as she wanted her contract and to start her business, I I, I would have gone out there and, and stood on the street corner like I was selling pizzas to get her that contract because I wanted her to succeed as much as she did, and she did. But she had her team behind her so that she could, and that's what she said, so that she could have that arsenal, those people that she could go to, her go-to people when she needed them. She didn't know if she would ever have a problem, and, and, and to be just candid, she got this contract from the time that she had been working on this contract until she got the contract, and she got the contract to me, um, I had about, mm, I would say, 36 hour, 48 hours to, to go through her contract. And so not a lot of time, and she had given me, the forewarning was, this was on a Monday, I'm going to get the contract on Tuesday. Um, they want the contract back on Friday because the work's supposed to start on Monday. So, so she and and whenever we were talking in August, did I think that it was going to go that quickly? No. And did I know how important it was to her? Yes. And so, but I wanted her to be in the best possible position, and I didn't want her to have those pitfalls that I knew that she wasn't looking for in that contract. And so we went through it, and I gave her these questions that she needed to ask of her purchasing officer so that she could get this contract the way we all wanted it to be to protect her. And she did it, got the contract back to her on Thursday evening, and um, it was executed, and she began work on Monday. So with that, would you like to take a break? Okay, we are back, and I'm just going to finish just a couple of um, points with regard to contracts. Since everyone has been uh, keeping up and no questions, we're going to move forward. Um, on contracts, um, I just wanted to mention just a couple of pointers here. Um, you have to have the ability to enter into an, a, a contract. You have to have the capacity. So, for example, when I'm talking about contracts, just a basic is is that we require that people be uh, of sufficient age, that would be 18, to enter into a contract. They have uh, the mental capacity to enter into a contract. Uh, the contract can't be for an illegal purpose, so we have to do something that is legal, and uh, we don't think we have any illegal intent here in this room, but that is uh, something that we have to uh, consider. Uh, the contract cannot be entered into under duress, um, and there cannot be any fraud in the inducement in a contract. In other words, um, 
you say you are who you are, uh, the contract is for this purpose, and there cannot be any fraudulent intent in the inducement to enter into the contract. If there is fraud in the inducement in a contract, uh, then there may very well be a, a lawsuit as a result thereof. Also, um, all contracts, we were talking during the break, all contracts have a provision in them that the contract shall be construed under the laws of, and that is usually the state of Oklahoma, if we're in Oklahoma. Uh, I see contracts now and then that say under the laws of the state of Texas. And I have had contracts for companies that I represent, uh, and it may be a Texas provider of services, and in that Texas provider's contract, they the contract will say that the contract shall be construed under the laws of the state of Texas. And what that means is that if we in Oklahoma have a problem with that contract, well, we're going to have to go to the state of Texas in order to enforce that contract. Now, if we're in Oklahoma and we're Oklahomans, we don't want to go to Texas for many reasons. Not the least of which is to enforce a contract because if you have a Texas court and a Texas party on one side and we're on the other side, uh, you can see that there's going to be a natural advantage towards that Texas resident and not us. So you want to make sure that you look and see that those contracts are construed under the laws of the state of Oklahoma. And uh, that gives you an advantage. Um, and uh, the parties must consent, of course, to the contract. Now, if there is a, an error in the contract, let's, let's say, for example, um, the contract has been completed, the contract has been executed, uh, we have started the work on the contract, and we're moving forward with the work, and then suddenly someone realizes that we didn't dot all the I's, cross all the T's, and there is a mistake in the contract. That is an affirmative defense in the contract. A mistake might be that we agreed to perform our services for one dollar per hour where we left out two zeros. Instead of one hundred, the contract says one dollar. Well, yes sir? Yes. Yes. Excuse me. Uh, when anyone asks a question, would you mind just repeating it so we get the audio? Thank you. Okay. Thank you yes. Much. The question was asked if there's federal funding involved, will the federal um, provisions supersede those of the state of Oklahoma? And the answer is yes. So thank you for that question. And if you anyone else wants to um, uh, in, ask any question, provide any additional help on that or clarification for others, that is appreciated, and thank you for that. Um, so uh, if there is a mistake in a contract, then, uh, then we can go back and we can correct that. And the reason is because a contract has to, um, has to have in it what is called a meeting of the minds. The four corners of the document have to contain within those four corners of the document, and we actually, like I said, we refer to it as that, a meeting of the minds. If we don't have a meeting of the minds, and that is uh, in the offer they said $100 an hour, I said sure I'll do it for $100 an hour, and then it says a dollar an hour, um, then one there's a mistake in the contract. However, we might have not have a meeting in the minds because they said okay we'll pay at the so-and-so rate which is two percent above uh, prime or two percent above what the going rate is that they pay for certain contracts in this area. There may not be a meeting of the minds in that case and I understood it to be a certain amount, they understood it to be this amount and there's not a meeting of the minds. I've actually had that happen, I've had it happen with a court where someone was um, completing a settlement for me at the court and another attorney, this was uh, many years ago in Tulsa, and they had settled a case for me, but they had settled it at an amount 
based upon a rate which was incorrect. When that happened, um, it was going to increase the amount of the settlement by, it was going to double it. I phoned the attorney and told the attorney that, that he knew that that was not the correct rate. The attorney in my office just made a complete mistake. Uh, not my, it was not my office, it was an office where I worked in Tulsa, but that uh, attorney had made a mistake and wasn't really paying attention. And he's, his response to that was, well, um, yes, but so-and-so signed the, uh, the settlement agreement and this is what it is, this is what it's going to be, and uh, this is what your client is going to have to pay. And my response to that was, there is not a meeting of the minds. Uh, this uh, this uh, settlement agreement does not reflect the agreement of the parties. You know what the agreement of the parties was, and that's what we're going to pay. And uh, his response again was, fine, we'll then um, uh, hold you to the contract. And my out was, um, that's fine, we'll appeal it. We'll, go, we'll appeal it, we'll go up to the Supreme Court, and we'll see what the Supreme Court says about this. Or you can have your check and have your money within 10 days, which was going to have it within 10, 10 days anyway. And he decided that it would be better to have his money that he agreed upon within 10 days rather than take advantage of someone who had simply made a mistake and he knew of the mistake. And that's called character and integrity, which this individual on the other side did not have. And likewise, if you see where someone has made a mistake and you know that they have made a mistake and say that contract's supposed to be for $100, but someone in that contract, someone has added a zero, and so instead of $100 per hour, it's $1,000 per hour, then it behooves you to go back to them and say, uh, this says uh, $1,000 an hour. Uh, isn't it your understanding? It's my understanding it should be $100 an hour. I would like to take $1,000 an hour, but I don't think that's really what you intend to pay. And I can tell you that that person will be your best friend forever, and that that will not be the last contract that you get and that uh, it's better for you to point that out. And, um, and there are times uh, in my practice where I get uh, paid by, say for example, a third party administrator and it has happened that I have been paid again by uh, a company twice. So I get two payments. And so what I do is I just send that check back and the, the second check, I to the, to the party and tell them that this has been paid in error. These checks have gone from anywhere from 1000 to 5000 to over $20,000 and these checks come in the office and they go back. Now, would they ever find this check for $1,000 or $500? Is that ever anything that anyone is going to find? I don't know. It's not my concern, but it's not my money and it goes back. And uh, some I've been questioned actually on that uh, to the extent of are you sure this was a, the, a double payment or a duplicate payment? Are you sure? And my response is to the penny. It is the it is a duplicate payment to the penny. I'm going to void this check and return it to you, and you can do with it what you want. But I want you to know that this was paid in, in error, and um, and and they understand what that comes from. It's, and a lot of people wouldn't do that and, or they would hold that money, they would put that money in their account, they would say if this is something that is, it may never be caught, it may not be caught for a year, I don't care when it's caught, the check is going back. So if you see someone on the other side that's making a mistake, draw their attention to that mistake and um, don't take advantage just like you don't want to be taken advantage of. Um, if something is unconscionable um, or there's a some kind of a frustration of the purpose of the contract, those are also affirmative defenses. So like I, I said, I think that I've got the, you've got the venue, which would be the state of Oklahoma. You understand um, who's going to enforce that, where you're going to enforce that, and that leads us right into our next topic of mediation and arbitration and our PowerPoint. Okay. We call it dispute, we, well, it's actually called Alternative Dispute Resolution, ADR. And you hear that a lot. And dispute resolution is another name for mediation and arbitration. And there is a distinct and very, they're very different, a distinct difference between mediation and 
arbitration. Um, in mediation, you have a mediator, and I work as a mediator. And mediators don't make decisions for parties. Mediators uh, help the parties that are in a dispute agree to a resolution of their dispute. They don't make the decision for the parties. Mediators cannot make the decision for the parties. So in order for parties who are in a dispute to get to this first level of mediation, then what they have to do, they have to agree to mediate. You, you can't even be forced into mediation. You have to agree to it. Now, if you're in a court, and you've gone beyond, you know, you might have a provision in your contract that calls for mediation. Okay, and you'll want to do that because that can save time, it can save money. If you're in a court setting, then you might be ordered by a court to enter into mediation. And what that does is it saves the court time. It uh, may resolve the, uh, the issue quicker and at a lesser cost and then other cases can move up onto the court's docket much more rapidly. So you have an impartial participant by a mediator. Um, the mediator cannot impose a settlement, cannot force one party or the other to, uh, to enter into a settlement. In the civil suit, the judge may order mediation. Um, you can also file a motion in a lawsuit and you can ask the court for mediation. If we have a case that we have on appeal, can you see it? Can you see okay? If we have a case that is on appeal uh, with the Oklahoma Supreme Court, or we have a case, as we do have cases right now, we have one case that is going to mediation, I believe, a uh, week from Monday, the 28th, that's right. Um, and that is a case where the judge in this case, in uh, Oklahoma County District Court has ordered the parties to mediate. In that case, the court enters an order for mediation, and after that order is entered, then the parties then have to proceed to affect the result or the outcome that that judge wants. What that means is, is the parties have to get together and they say, okay, well, Judge, judge Smith wants us to mediate this case, therefore, we need to select a mediator and a date and a time to mediate. That doesn't mean that the judge wants us to settle the case. It means that the judge wants, let's say, this side of the room and this side of the room to come together in a room with a mediator in the, in the, to, in the meeting to preside, to help facilitate some kind of resolution so that this side of the room, these parties, can talk to this side of the room, these parties, and we can understand the different sides face to face and that can really facilitate a resolution of a case. Um, like I said, you can ask for it. Sometimes a judge may order it. Uh, it says uh, as far mediation must be uh, initiated within 60 days. Uh, we have other provisions in other uh, cases where even the 60 days maybe could be extended, it could be less than 60 days. Sometimes we can't find mediators. Sometimes we have mediators that have difficulties. Some, I've seen cases where I thought I was going to have a mediation within two weeks only to find that it didn't happen for four months. Um, in many states, uh, a party may move within a certain period after order of referral to dispense with mediation or arbitration if the issue to be considered has been previously mediated or arbitrated between the same parties or the issue presents a question of law only, the order violates other state statutes or other good causes shown. Um, if the issue presents a question of law only, in my experience, I have not seen any issue like that go to a mediator. A mediator would not be able to uh, bring parties together to decide a question of law because if you were in a court setting, uh, you wouldn't have two lawyers get parties together to, to try to resolve an issue of law. That issue of law, if, and I've seen issues of law that can only be decided 
not even by the court, a trial court. They might not be decided even by a court of appeals. They might not be decided until you get to the Oklahoma Supreme Court. Uh, outside of a court proceeding, like I said, before you even get to court, you can initiate mediation to resolve your difference, differences. But even if you have a case and you are in litigation, you can initiate mediation on your own to try to resolve it with or without the court's intervention. The court may order you to, to mediation or you may, if the other side won't agree, you may ask the court for mediation. If you ask the court for mediation because you couldn't get the other side to agree to it, the court will generally have a very positive reaction to your request for mediation and then enter an order for mediation so that the parties can get together and try to reach a resolution. Um, selecting a mediator, uh, I have um, mediators that I like and that I know that are effective. I have others that are not. Mediators do not have to be, um, they don't have to be lawyers. Um, if they're selected by the court, generally they are. Um, I have had um, situations where I've had mediators that were not lawyers uh, and I've had mediations conducted um, in differing places, even in uh, a library in Seminole, Oklahoma uh, with a non-lawyer. Um, the case was not settled. People flew in from different parts of the country and uh, we won't do that again. So uh, we want, we would rather have, um, he didn't take it very seriously and I believe he thought he might have been, the mediator might have been intimidated by the lawyers and that's what you don't want and so you'd rather have um, a lawyer um, engaged in that process because if your mediator is intimidated by lawyers because the mediator believes that the lawyers know more about the law, one, the mediator's right the lawyers do know more about the law, but if they're going to be intimidated by that and they don't need to be because they're not there to decide the law, they're not there to tell people what to do or how to resolve the case, they are only there to facilitate the communication between the parties so that they can reach an agreement. So whether the mediator knows anything about the law or not, is it's really not relevant. The mediator can still have a successful outcome without being a lawyer. And sometimes they may do better than a lawyer simply because they're not going to be hung up in the law. But in this case, this, it didn't work with this mediator. And I, th I think he thought he was outgunned, and that's unfortunate because it wasted a lot of time and a lot of money. And um, we would not have done that had we known that he was going to have that kind of reaction. Um, mediation procedures. Um, Usually what happens in a mediation, like I said, you'll have the parties that come in together. A lot of people, um, they, they shorten this, and it's unfortunate, and I don't, I don't like that. And what they do is they have the parties, and they, they, they should bring them together in the same room. You usually have a spokesperson. The spokesperson then will state their side of the case. Usually that's the, the plaintiff's side the aggrieved party's side, the party that has the problem, and then the other side that's on the defensive side, they will say why they think that there is not a problem and that everything is fine and that there shouldn't be an issue. Between those two sides, then after they've stated their case, and that can take 15 minutes or 30 minutes, and the mediator will say, okay, um, Martha, you have 30 minutes. Are you the spokesperson for this side? And Martha will say yes. And then they'll say, Mike, are you the spokesperson for this side? And Mike will say yes. Okay, well, Martha, do you want to go first and you want to tell us about the case and the facts of the case? And so Martha will then state her strong case for why she's aggrieved and why she has a, a problem that needs to be resolved. And then after Martha's finished, then Mike, he will step forward or as he's seated and he will state why Martha does not have a case and why Martha shouldn't receive anything, why Martha uh, is not aggrieved and Martha isn't owed anything that she's asked for. Okay? After that, then what the mediator usually does is he says, okay, well, in some cases what they'll do is they'll say, well, this side only has two people or three people or a smaller number of people, so we're going to ask this side to leave the room and go into this other room, an ante room, or another room at the courthouse, or another room in the mediator's office, and then I'm going to keep this larger group in the room with me, um, in, in this room, right where we are, so they don't all have to get up, and they don't all have to take their things, it's just easier. 
And so then the mediator, um, before he's actually let them spread apart and, and leave, he talks about or she talks about the confidentiality of the mediation and that anything that's said in the mediation stays within the mediation. And a lot of times, um, it depends, a lot of times they will have everyone sign a confidentiality agreement. And so in that agreement, let's see if we talk about that. No. Okay. Uh, a confidentiality agreement so that what is stated in the mediation stays in the mediation. Um, it's supposed to stay that way. Um, and really no one's going to uh, talk about anything that they wouldn't want shared anyway. But in some cases you'll see, and I like mediations in the respect that they let me see the other side. And if I'm, say, on Mike's side and I'm on the defensive side, well then what I want to do is I want to see what Martha has to say and what her witnesses are going to state and I want to see how strong my case is and it, and it lets me have a chance to evaluate the other side and whether I think we have a good case or not. And so what we're really trying to do is come to an agreement to resolve an issue. So after we separate, then the mediator talks usually to one side or the other, and it would usually be Martha's side, which we would call, in most cases, the plaintiff's side of the case. And then in this instance, the plaintiff's side of the case would state what their grievance is, and the mediator would say, well, I see where you have filed lawsuit for $150,000. And uh, tell me more about this. Why is this? And, um, and that's what you're seeking here today is settlement in the amount of $150,000 and Martha says yes, the plaintiff says yes. And then mediator says, well, I'm going to go and talk to the other side. I'm not going to tell them that's what you are asking for. I'm not going to talk to them about any of this. I'm just gonna see what their side states. And so the mediator then goes into the other room and talks privately with Mike and Mike says, they aren't owed, the defense says they aren't owed anything in this case. Um, they didn't do this, they didn't do this, they didn't do this. In fact, they cost us um, X number of dollars, the project was delayed, and we aren't willing to pay anyone. We had to call somebody else in to complete the project. Mediator goes back, and the mediator goes back and forth to try to resolve this. Mediator goes back to Martha or to the plaintiff and states, well, I understand from the defense that this happened, this happened, and this happened, and that the project was delayed, and then the plaintiff explains why the project was delayed. It was because the contract wasn't written in time. There were problems with the contract. There were problems with supplies. Uh, there may have been uh, other factors that caused the, um, the delay in the project or the performance of the project. And in that instance, the uh, Martha says, well, I understand that, and I know that, and I know that we've asked for $150,000, but we would take $75,000 to resolve this matter. And the mediator will ask, can I go back to the other side and tell them that you would take $75,000, or do you, want, um, to, you want, do you want me to keep that confidential? Martha says, no, 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 I don't want them to know that I would only take $75,000 because if I tell them right now that I want $75,000, they're probably only going to want to pay me $25,000. So you kind of see how this works, okay? They go back and forth, and the mediator is required only to reveal what you've told the mediator to reveal to the other side so that the mediator can help those two parties re receive uh, and resolve the case, receive what they want, resolve the case. Um, in many instances, like I said, uh, in the beginning, mediators don't bring the parties together so that the parties can see each other. And uh, you need to know, you know, as far as mediators are concerned, whether or not they're going to do that because if they don't, you really lose the advantage of knowing who you're dealing with. You don't get that opportunity to really put your eyes on that other person, that other group, that other party, to eyeball them and to see what kind of witnesses they have and what kind of stance they have because and you're dealing more in a vacuum. You're dealing with the mediator and just simply what the mediator tells you is no more than what you already knew from your case filing. So, yes, sir. So a mediator is going to try to remain unbiased but advocate for both sides at the same time. Correct. And, and why? Do you know why the mediator would want to do that? It doesn't make sense, but why do you think? I can have an idea. Well, to come to a resolution. 
Right. And the reason that the mediator wants, the question is, the mediator is um, going to try to remain unbiased. That's correct. The mediator is not going to take one side or the other. It's going to be try to be fair and impartial and maintain confidentiality. And the... Right. He's going to, he really wants to advocate he wants to advocate for a resolution, but not advocate for one party or the other. And he's going to point out to the other side what might have been said as far as weaknesses in the other side's case. That that will happen. And he's going to say, This is what I was told, um, and and without saying this is a fact, this is what I was told, and I don't know if this is true or not, and then the other side's going to think, hmm, okay, well, that's what they, they know that, and they understand this weakness, and it starts to get people to thinking about the value of their case and whether there can be a resolution. So uh, that is in his favor. The other thing that's in the favor of the mediator, and the reason that they want so much to resolve these cases and they try so hard to reach an agreement and a resolution in a mediation is because if they are successful then you're all going to know it I'm going to know it if I'm an attorney in this mediation and attorneys are oftentimes in mediations I'm going to know it and if that mediator was successful in this case then I'm going to want to, to, to use them again because I'm going to try to get them to uh, mediate the next case I have because I know that they're good. And a lot of times mediators that know the law they'll say well okay Martha or Victoria you're not going to get this in this case because the law states that you can't get this and this and this you can only get this portion and a lawyer will be able to tell you that whereas a non-lawyer won't be able to tell you that and they won't know the law and so it's helpful to have someone who knows what you can and can't get and you're asking for more than what you can get or those provisions are something that you've entered into and so you've waived, you may have waived certain things that you want just in the process and the procedures that you're entering into in the, uh, in the mediation, in, in the case that leads to mediation. Okay, now that's mediation. Arbitration is found, it's, it's found in contracts, and I believe in, in the, some of the federal contracts there's an arbitration clause, and it's final, it's binding, and you, you hear, you know, um, binding arbitration. That's, that's, we all hear, have you all heard of binding arbitration? Um, and as, as a lawyer, we don't, I personally, and most lawyers, that enter into contracts don't like arbitration for ourselves, for our own contracts. And why is that? Well, because we go to court. We go down to the courthouse. We uh, take our cases to court if we had a case. Um, and we know the judges. And I would rather fight my case before a judge and in a courtroom than I would with an arbitrator. So if there's a if there's been a provision in a contract for me and I don't I don't want to to arbitrate well then for me which may not be necessarily an option for everyone I will line item that out and initial and say we will not agree to arbitration. We would rather go down to any district court um, Oklahoma County District Court and take our case before the court we don't want to uh, to arbitrate. And but in all in other cases you'll see an arbitration provision and uh, the ar when we do that we have the American Arbitration Association rules that we go by and I have arbitrated cases and when you arbitrate you may you may get an arbitrator from um, I've had a, from St. Louis or from New Mexico uh, you may have arbitrations uh, in Miami Florida with an arbitrator from Los Angeles. Um, you file a copy of the demand for arbitration with the appropriate regional office of the American Arbitration Association. Um, you have a copy of the arbitration provisions of the contract and you have to pay the filing fee. Uh, by the way, on mediations, uh, usually that fee is split between the parties for the, uh, for the mediator. Um, and for non-American um, arbitration contracts, uh, parties may file a joint written submission to arbitrate. 
Um, now, the selection of the arbitrator is kind of an issue. It's kind of, it's, it's interesting how that's done. Usually you start off with a certain number of names, and those names, it's an odd number of names, and the names, uh, you have five names or seven names, usually it's seven, and what the parties do is they, they start out with seven names, and then they, one party strikes the first name, and the second party strikes the second name. And then you go back to the first party, and then they get to strike the next name that they don't like. Then you go back and forth and back and forth until you have whittled that seven down to the last remaining person on the list, and that's the arbitrator. And that's how you choose the arbitrator. The fees and the other costs, a lot of times those fees are borne by the parties to the arbitration. They split the cost. And payable upon the completion, but that's going to depend upon the arbitrator, and that's going to depend upon whether they think they're going to be paid or not, and if they have any kind of issue or question about that, they may want to be paid up front. So, uh, so do you enter into a separate contract with either the uh, arbitrator or with the um, mediator? Well, you, they, a lot of times they do, they'll have a, they'll have a letter agreement and they'll want the parties, it's, it's not very long, it's, they'll want the parties to sign off on that agreement to mediate or arbitrate and to sign off on that. And they'll state their fee and their fee for the review of documents. A lot of times they'll want a settlement statement or an arbitration or a mediation statement and so they can review the facts before they, they proceed. And then they'll charge a certain amount to review that statement. And then they'll charge a certain amount, um, they can charge an amount per day and then they can add on by the day or by the hour. If this is an arbitration that's expected to be three days, they may charge for three days or they may charge for the first day and then they may add. But there are certain provisions with ODOT. No, there is a separate arbitration, I believe, uh, provision or I'm, someone had mentioned that before with ODOT. In, on, on arbitration, right? There are different rules for that, and if you're entering into an ODOT um, contract, then there are some other arbitration uh, procedures that you can use that are to the benefit of you uh, aside from this. So this uh, is, uh, like I said, this is a general overview of arbitration. Now, the, arbitra the arbitrator in these arbitration cases does make the decision as opposed to the mediator who is facilitating and trying to bring the parties together to compromise and to bring about a decision on their own. So um, the arbitrator will make the decision. And it's interesting though that in, if you're following these rules of the American Arbitration Association that you can appeal that decision of the arbitrator to a three judge panel of arbitrators and so that, even though it's a binding arbitration, um, in certain instances it may be appealable. So um, it's, it's in some ways um, it's supposed to be faster and easier. Uh, the rules are a little bit different. Uh, courts are trying to get parties, people, entities to enter into um, arbitration or mediation and so that it doesn't burden the court with uh, unnecessary cases that the court needs to hear to take up the time of the court and jury. So it is a, um, it's, it's a monetary value to the court if they can get people to mediate or arbitrate their disputes. Conditions for appeals of arbitration awards. The award was procured um, by corruption, fraud, or other undue means. There was evident partiality or misconduct by an arbitrator. The arbitrator exceeded his or her powers. The arbitrator improperly refused to postpone the hearing or hear evidence. There was no arbitration agreement. If you have an agreement even in a mediation or an arbitration, then that, that agreement is put in writing, like a contract, and, uh, the, and it can be very detailed, and then the parties will date and sign that agreement, and then that becomes the agreement of the parties in a mediation or in the case of an, arbit 
arbitration, the arbitrator will write that order of the arbitrator. And um, when it says right here there was no arbitration agreement, there was no agreement to arbitrate should there be a dispute. So you couldn't have gotten to an arbitrator to begin with. Oops. Okay, payment bond claims. Um, we, Just a quick question before you go on. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> and these mediation and the arbitration, you know, you hear all the time, well, that's the amount of money you think you may be owed. Is it worth going into a, a legal situation or mediation or arbitration? You know, at what point do you say, okay, 100000 is it worth the headache and the, and the legal fees or this or that or, you know, is 500 worth it, 500,000, you know, is there some kind of ballpark where you say it's worth it or it's not worth it? Because I think on being a sub most of the time, the tribe will, you know, they'll just do you down or, you know, or, or, or withhold so much because they know that, you know, it's not worth a fight for that amount. Okay. So, you, you know, yes. they're, they're always, like, like you were telling me earlier about the concrete guy, okay. you know. Okay, uh, well then, oh, let me repeat this question. Okay, so the question is whether it is worth it to mediate or arbitrate a case or or not. Uh, if it's $500,000 or if it's $100,000, is it worth it? Do you think you're going to, to get anything out, out of the mediation or the arbitration, you know, what do, what do you expect? Well, to receive and return for your payment. So what you're really talking about is the cost-benefit analysis of engaging the services of another, whether it is a mediator or an arbitrator and an attorney, any one of the three, or an attorney and any one of the two, to resolve the dispute you have. Is it worth it? It's your time, because it takes you away from picking other work or, you know, taking care of the work you have on hand. That's correct. You're right. So that that's the question, is it the cost-benefit analysis of, it, of getting into uh, arbitration or mediation? Well, I can tell you that first, of, first and foremost, that uh, as, uh, as a group, uh, attorneys are perhaps the most are, uh, careful group of individuals um, and uh, perhaps the least litigious on their own part. And that is because they uh, make very good agreements to begin with. Uh, they're careful and they don't want to litigate because they litigate all the time. So they, if they're litigators, they don't want to get involved in those types of disputes, so they make sure that they have good, agree good agreements to begin with. So on your part, you, the tipping point, there's a, there is actually there's a book, and it is called The Tipping Point. And so you have to see how far you're going to get before you, you get to the tipping point, which is going to cause you to tip over to the other side and say, okay, I don't have any choice but to go after this money. And we were talking about a situation involving a contractor who was to be paid for um, the work that he was to perform um, in a setting. Um, and at the end of the performance of this contract, the person that he was uh, performing his services for found a defect in the end result of that contract and and this involved uh, this involved construction and in the end uh, the person a private party found a defect in this um, construction project and said that he wasn't going to pay and instead of paying the 100 percent of the the contract price, he would pay 50% believing that the person that had performed or the company that had performed these services would take the 50%. Uh, the private party was wrong and instead the individuals ended up in court and the court they ended up in was ironically, as we spoke earlier, was in Texas and, 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 uh, and nothing, it could have been against Texas, it could have been Kansas, it could have been any other state, but the point is is that this was an entity in Oklahoma, in this state, and they ended up in an entity out of this state, and with a jury out of this state, 
and it was based upon what the other party perceived to be um, a defect in the performance of the contract or the actual outcome and say the the building there's a defective building there was a defective structure there was a defective uh, surface defective asphalt d something was defective and so the 50 percent of that contract price was offered and then rejected in, as in a settlement and they went to court and the jury awarded uh, the contractor 100 percent so, you know, sometimes, and, and, and research had been done with regard to this party that wouldn't pay, and it was found that this party had this, uh, this uh, way of doing business, and that, that this had not been the first time. So research was done. We do a lot of research on cases, uh, and we and, and found out that this was the same MO, and the way to stop this from occurring was to go all the way and and to take it to court um, if for no other reason than on principle. Now principles cost money and um, but um, principles sometimes can save you money in the long run if then you estab establish yourself as someone who is going to uh, go to the mat and they've entered into a contract, they have performed the contract, they have done what they were supposed to do, they, they did it right, they know they did it right, and they want to be paid for their services, and, um, and they are going to go to court, they're going to go, they'll try to mediate perhaps, or they may try to arbitrate, or they may say, forget all that, we're filing a lawsuit, and we'll take you to court, and, and we'll get our money, period. And so I've seen that happen. So you have to see what the tipping point is. Yes, ma'am. Depends on the court. Depends on the the question is, do they get paid the money for their time for the lawyer for the legal fees? Uh, prevailing party uh, usually does get their their attorney's fees, and the attorney fee, the attorney files a motion for their attorney fees. They file that motion with a court, and then the court hears that motion. And you know, uh, it depends on what that fee is. But uh, in in a lot of cases, you might see um, uh, cases uh, in the range of. 50, 100, 150 million dollars, and the attorney's fee may be um, uh, 40 or 50 million dollars, and those attorney's fees are awarded by the court. Yes, so. Um, there's an exact case like that going on in Tulsa. I mean, identical. And, and the contractor won. But then the owner says, I don't care what he says, I'm still not paying. What did he do? Uh, well, that's a, now that's a case on the law. There, 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 um, there are ways to, uh, to execute on that judgment, and, uh, and attorneys know how to get that money after that judgment has been awarded. Uh, the other side may decide to appeal. They may take it to uh, in yeah, this. Doing, right, and, they, may, and they, they have the right to appeal. And they may say there was an error in law. And uh, they want to take that case to the the court of civil appeals, and then from there that case may go to um, the Oklahoma Supreme Court. It's so, so sad because this construction firm, I'm an engineer, so I, that has nothing to do mm -hmm. with me. But they downsized, and now they have these beautiful buildings, commercial, and now they're barely doing residential. They laid off all their people because the owner decided, no, nah, yeah, you got to award it, but I'm still going to appeal it. I, under, I understand, and that's that's one of the methods that people want to avoid. They want to have good contracts, and you, if you have to look at who you're dealing with too, and look at who is on the other side. And in the example that I gave earlier, and that we discussed um, at the break, um, I can guarantee that that contractor that I was referring to earlier won't do business with that private party again. That, that won't happen. And then others won't do business with that party again. And so you know, that, that word gets out and that reputation, that's all you have is your reputation. And so you, that reputation gets known by others. And so you then uh, understand that that's the process, the legal process. And we don't want, we don't want to enter into that legal arena. And then I tell my people that I represent, you know, we do anything to avoid um, getting into that legal arena.
I don't want you, any one of you, to have to hire a lawyer. Um, we are a necessary evil, if you will. I mean, because we're only involved in disputes between parties and we're trying to resolve those disputes and if we can't resolve them in any way we have to go to the last means, the last method that we can go to and that would be the court system. And so, and that's what we have to do, then that's what we have to do, but that's not something that we're, you know, we're afraid of doing, but we really want to avoid that and we don't want you to have to hire attorneys and so that's why those agreements and those contracts are so important up front so that everybody is clear on what we're supposed to do during what period of time, what our duties are, how much we're going to get paid, what happens if there's a problem, how are we going to resolve that. Um, where we're going to litigate that, if we have to litigate that, if we're going to do arbitration or mediation or not. So uh, a lot of those provisions are, are set forth up front and that can avoid a lot of headache in the end. And it doesn't hurt, as you just mentioned, um, this person says they're not going to pay, they're going to appeal it. Well, do background work on, um, on who you're getting ready to get enter into a contract with and, and check to see whether that individual has been involved in a lot of litigation and whether they pay their contracts. And you can, you can do research and you can see whether they have uh, a history of not paying um, subcontractors or if they have a history of breach of contract cases. And so you'll know whether they do and if that's the case then you can say, no, I don't want to do business with those people and I would rather not waste my time or my money. And, um, you know, no business with that party is probably better than chasing after the payment for the time and effort and money that you spent to do a project for that party and so you'd be better off not to do it at all. Um, <coughs> an example, I was talking to someone last week and someone brought to me um, someone very well known brought to me a case and it had been handled by another attorney and uh, this party lost and they wanted me to do the appeal. Well, um, and I, I, it's a it very um, well known entity, like I said, and yes, I would like to do work with that entity, that'd be, just, that'd be great. However, um, when you have an attorney or someone who has not done a good job and they've lost a case and they've lost a case for various reasons and you can look through a file and you can see where A through L went wrong and they've lost the case and you get to the point where you're going to file an appeal of this case, uh, you want to see whether you can um, make a silk purse out of a sow's ear, if you will, whether you can do any good on that case. and, and even if I am, you know, offered a handsome sum of money to take an appeal and people bring their boxes in for me to take over and handle this case through an appeal, um, I can do like I did a couple weeks ago and say, um, I've looked at this and thank you, but no thank you and and uh, I'm, I'm not going to take that. And someone, I was out of I was um, in New York last week and someone said, well, it's, it must be nice to turn down um, business like that. Well, you've got to think about the fact that um, it's not just that it must be nice. It doesn't mean that it's nice to do. Maybe it's the most prudent thing a person can do is to say, I don't want to do business with um, that entity like you're talking about or I don't want to take on this work or I don't want to take on this appeal I don't want to do this because after this uh, particular case has been um, so uh, badly handled I don't know if I can make it look as good as it needs to look. If I had handled it from the beginning, it wouldn't be in the position that it is in now. So I don't know if I can if I can rectify that or make it better or get a better result for these people. And so, and yes, I would like to do business with these people. And uh, certainly, I believe that will happen in the future. But if I took a bad case right now, and I tried to correct that case, then it didn't have that good result, it's not likely that I would do business with them in the future. So I would rather start business with someone in the future fresh with something new and show them what I can do rather than take on something where someone has already made it a problem. So 
sometimes you have to really evaluate and decide whether it's in your best interest to take on a project and not everything that is brought before you may be something that you want to take. I have turned down many, many cases and I have turned down many clients and I'm not afraid to because in the end, as I mentioned earlier, as a lawyer I know that some things may not be in my best interest and you know we have so many hours in a day that we're going to work and we want to get paid for what we do and we want to do the best job that we can do and we have our reputation so we want to make sure that we're doing business with the people that we can do the best business for and who are going to appreciate and pay us for the work that we do and at the end of the day when all the dust settles we want to be paid for you know an honest wage or an honest amount for an honest day's work and if we want or expect anything less than that, we're selling ourselves short or we're not giving others what they expect to us to receive from us in the performance of a contract or the work that they expect to get. So that's how I operate. So did you have a question? Oh no, you touched on um, you know one, one of the things that I do going back to the contract, is there special guidelines, you know, is you would you recommend us, you know, present the contract? say a lawyer to, to look at it and make sure if we're dealing with you know a party that is not well known you know to avoid issues to avoid lawsuits I don't think you have to do that, you don't have to do that. no I don't I don't think you have to do that okay. because I don't know that if you present it to a lawyer um, a lot of people present things to me doctors companies I uh, don't know that you have to do that you can find out a lot of information on your own um, by um, search engines, the web, and you can do a lot of research on those entities that you're trying to do business with or you want to do business with, and you can find out a lot of information in that regard um, in, in your research. Find out what their reputation is. Ask other people that are in the same business, um, you know, have they heard of this, and if they if you don't want them to know about the business you're about to perform or the work you're going to do or what you're thinking and they say why do you want to know and you don't have to tell them that you're um, trying to uh, get a contract or work on a contract you just say well I heard about them I've never heard about them you know I'm just wondering what you knew about them you know you don't have to tell them everything you know uh, be an information gatherer rather than an information giver and so see what kinds of information you can pick up from other people before you engage in that con in that contract i was talking to um, a very good very good friend on the oklahoma supreme court and uh... she was talking to me she said um, do um, do you um, do you did you google so and so did you google them and i said i looked at her i was kind of surprised and i said um, i said i said well yes she said i google everyone I, I Google everyone, and I mean, and I, I never really thought about that. I thought um, because, and then I remember several years ago mentioning that term to um, my daughter of all people, and she said, you know, uh, she chided chided me and told me she said that is not a word that is not in Webster's dictionary. It might be now. Um, I think it has been added as a, as a term, but my point is is that you know go through and 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 Google. Uh, go through those different web engines and search engines and see what you can find out about other people and you might be surprised at, at what you can find out. Um, look at um, the Oklahoma Supreme Court Network and uh, you can go into the Oklahoma Supreme Court Network and when you enter that website you can see at the top or on the side, the top uh, it's about three bars into from the left and it says search dockets which is kind of a misnomer and or you can go down on the left side and I think it also says search dockets and when you go into search dockets you click all and then you can type in the name of the party entity and you can see and it will pull up uh, any cases that have been filed against that entity or any cases where they have been involved in litigation. It might ask you whether they've been a plaintiff or a defendant, but you can do your research that way. Will it show the business owner's name if it's a business? That information you can get. Will it show the business owner's name or the business that you're talking about is the question. That information, uh, you can find the business name um, through the Oklahoma Secretary of State and you can click on the business entity 
and then you can go through those search tools through that um, public entity and you can find out who the principals are that are behind that uh, business and then you can Google those names. Right. So, and that, that's that's where you you really want to do your homework. And if you, you have any red flags, but that's why I ask how to get their names because then you will find out the business and get the name and you put the name in. Mm -hmm. and that's right. Because it's a pattern. It, it, that's correct. It is a pattern. So you can do a lot of work up front to see whether you're dealing with people that are going to be honest and have character, right? And see if you're going to get paid. It's hard. To do. It's hard it is hard to do, but it's worth the effort. If it, if it comes easy, you know, easy come, easy go, and uh, just don't rely upon someone's word. You know, you want to get it in a contract, but you, like I said, you want to make sure that who you're contracting with is really who you're contracting with. A lot of times, you know, these days, when you, uh, if you were to close on um, uh, a mortgage or perhaps a car loan, you know, people want thumbprints and they want fingerprints. You might want someone's, I'm serious, and you might want someone's uh, driver's license. You might want to see proof of their identity when you're, you know, I, I'm doing this, I know this sounds um, uh, like I'm being over, uh, overly cautious, uh, but uh, this is just good business. Have you, do you do this? Do you, and just ask them if they do, if they get a copy of a driver's license and say, well, think about that, you might want to do that in the future. And then they might. And, but if they, if they don't want to give that information to you, well, then perhaps there's a reason why. Okay, so you just want to protect yourself in those contracts that you're, you're entering into. Okay, so now, would you guys like to take just a break for just a few minutes, and then we can start. It's about 10 minutes before 11 o'clock, and we can start back at 11. Does that work for you? Well, okay, so the question is, does it really save you anything to agree to arbitration? Um, I, I can see that arbitration can be very beneficial for um, certain uh, parties in certain situations. Let me give you an example. Um, if you are an employer and you have a contract with an employee and there is something that goes uh, wrong in that employment contract, the employer may not want to resolve that issue in a court because that jury is going to be made up of other employees, not employers. So you're not going to have a jury of your peers. So in that case, it might be better for the employer to have an arbitration clause in that, in, in that agreement rather than uh, to go to court. Uh, but that's not the case that we're talking about here. Uh, some cases might be so complicated that you wouldn't get a jury to understand what you're talking about and so you might want to uh, enter into arbitration because you might have more time with an arbitrator and you might think in some ways that it is perhaps less expensive to go to court than it would be to arbitrate well it's because the court is a public entity available to all right and arbitration is something that you have to pay for but there is a little bit of a misnomer in that in that uh, with an arbitrator or with a mediator you might not need an attorney that's one so you're not going you might not have to pay the services of an attorney or as in a court of law you would have to pay for the services of an attorney a corporate entity cannot represent itself a corporate entity must have an attorney. So you would need an attorney in that setting. So, but if you had arbitration or mediation, it might give you that out, especially mediation, and then your backup would be that you would always have that um, uh, court proceeding waiting in the wings so that you could, you could go that route. So is it going to save you money? Uh, it might save you money because you might not have this protracted litigation um, with court dockets. I mean, you can try to get a court case set today and you might not get a trial date until um, uh, September 2013, January 2013 and um, I, uh, I've seen cases that have gone on for years and we we're talking about appeals. I've seen appeals, I've seen cases that have gone on from start to jury verdict for three years and then I've seen an appeal go on for ten years thereafter. So. 
so that so you know so that can that can be a, it can be a very long process to go through the court system, and long processes involving attorneys can be costly. And so, uh, if you get a mediator or an arbitrator, it might cost you money, but it, it saves you money in the long run. And you, yes, you're with a private entity that you have to pay, but you're going to pay to go to court regardless, even though you're not having to pay for a judge to hear your case. Does that answer your question? Yes. yes. Okay. Now. Okay. Now. Payment bond claims and performance bond claims, talking about that is not going to be very helpful if we don't know what a bond is. So um, as far as uh, a bond, um, I've picked out the easiest, uh, most general definitions of bonds. And you probably can uh, answer this question, but it's interesting that um, I was working with an attorney a couple of weeks ago, about four weeks ago now, and uh, he didn't know what kind of bond he needed or how to obtain a bond uh, in a case for an appeal. Um, and um, he was not a new attorney. He should have known how to do this, but not everyone understands what a bond is or how to obtain a bond. And so I am uh, just kind of a, a history buff. And so I had mentioned this when I spoke last, and so I wanted to just, just throw this out at you. And you can just see how far back these go. Individual surety bonds are the original form of surety ship. Well, what's a surety? Well, a surety is a guarantee in finance. It's a promise to pay by one party to assume responsibility for the debt or obligation of a borrower if that borrower defaults. The person or company that provides this promise, this surety, is also known as a surety or guarantor. Okay? So that's what a surety is. It's a entity that is engaging in a promise to pay to pick up that responsibility should someone, you, or the person entering into the contract default on the performance or, or in some case, or payment. Individual surety bonds um, are the original form of surety ship. The earliest known record of a contract of surety ship is in Mesopotamian tablets written around 2750 B.C. There is evidence of individual surety bonds in the code of Babylon, Persia, Rome, Carthage, and the ancient Hebrews and later England. It wasn't until 1840 that the first corporate surety was organized, the Guarantee Society of London. In 1865, the Fidelity Insurance Company became the first U.S. corporate surety company, but the venture soon failed. Contract bonds used heavily in the construction industry are a guarantee from a surety to a project's owner, the obligee, that a general contractor or principal will adhere to the provisions of the contract. Included in this category are bid bonds. It's a guarantee that the contractor will enter into a contract if awarded the bid. Performance bonds, a guarantee that the contractor will perform the work as specified by the contract. Payment bonds guarantee that the contractor will pay for services and materials. And maintenance bonds guarantee that a contractor will provide the facility prepare and upkeep for a specified period of time. There are also miscellaneous contract bonds that come into play that do not fall into the categories above but are simply extra additional types of bonds. Uh, the most common of which are subdivision and supply bonds. So we also have, as you, some of you might know, we're not going to ask for any show of hands, but we have court bonds. Somebody might need a bond to get out of jail, but we won't ask for any raising of hands at this point. If you know what that is, you don't need to tell us, but that, those are also <laughs> bonds as well. And uh, that's what we're talking about when we're talking about bonds. Someone. 
That's no, that's saying, correct. And, and just because I went in and tried to protest, I had to pay like eighty-five dollars worth of court costs. That's correct. If you if you have a traffic citation, you have a traffic ticket, and you want to contest that, then typically you will have to post a bond to protest that ticket. And when you do, the bond is equal to the amount of the ticket. And you're wondering why then you would post that bond. Well, very likely you might prevail on that ticket uh, or that traffic ticket or that parking ticket or that speeding ticket. And you might prevail simply because the person or entity, the officer that wrote that ticket didn't show up for the hearing. And then you would prevail simply for that reason alone. Do you get that money back? Mm -hmm, you would. You might not get the court costs back, but you would you you wouldn't pay the one hundred fifty dollars perhaps for the parking ticket, but you might pay the court costs and you might ask the court for the court costs back and to be totally candid with you, um, traffic court is a court that I have never practiced in. So I can't answer that question. Uh, and um, but I uh, I have seen others that have but that's what a, that's what a bond is. So and I avoid parking tickets as well. <laughs> they can be costly. So, so we're talking about bonds, that concept of what when you have to go get a bail bondsman and you have to get that bail bondsman to write a bond for you for a certain amount of money. Likewise, you're talking about performance bonds in the same way that you're talking about uh, someone who is writing a bond for you for the performance of your obligation under a contract. Same thing, same concept as the bond that you uh, are more familiar with in some ways. Uh, someone's uh, writing a bond for you and guaranteeing your appearance in court. Or uh, you're posting a bond to guarantee that you're going to either uh, fight that ticket and pay for that ticket or not. Because after you post the bond and you pay for the ticket in its entirety, you may decide that you don't have as good a case as you thought you had to begin with, and therefore you want to just forfeit the bond and let that bond uh, be used to pay the traffic ticket or parking ticket. You won't want to do that in the case of a surety bond because the surety company might not want uh, to let that happen. Okay, now we have performance bonds and a contractor may um, be required to have three bonds for contracts and we might have to have a performance bond for 100% of the value of the contract to con ensure completion of the work. We might have to have a defect bond for 100% of the value of the contract to provide correction of defects in the construction and equipment for one year after acceptance of the work and we might have to have a payment bond for 100 percent of the contract to assure that the owner is protected from action of subcontractors, suppliers and employees for unpaid debts of the contractor. Okay, So those are bonds that if you're working on obtaining contracts they can provide um, a hang up for you. And so while you're getting together your, uh, your arsenal or your team to back you up while you're um, getting your business or your contracts underway, don't forget the bonds because if you do and that contract is about to be awarded and you have a very short time frame or turnaround time, um, it could take uh, longer to get the bond uh, than, what, than the amount of time that you have to execute the contract. And the contract may not be able to be executed without uh, the bond. And so if you don't have that, uh, you're in jeopardy of losing that contract. Um, and I know that everyone wants to help you get to where you need to be, but simply put, if without that bond, uh, you're not going to get anywhere. And so that's critical to the contracting process. Would that be correct, Mr. Penny? Thank you very much. He affirmed. Thank you. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I've never understood when you have a project and you have to put bonds up, why are they withhold retainers too? I mean, you've got 100%. If you're going to be paid on all of this, why are they withholding retainers too? I mean, nobody's ever been able to answer that for me. I mean, I understand if you don't have a bond to hold retainers. 
But if they're guaranteed by your bonds, why are they withholding money? Uh, my best, you're talking, my best answer to that, could you, would you address that or would you like to address that? I can, I can give my best answer for that. Um, uh, the, the, reason that, the reason that you might do so, or the reason that I might do so, is because there's a cost associated with the fact that uh, you didn't perform the contract or there's a defect in the contract or uh, we had to get to the stage of uh, executing on a bond. So there is a, there's a cost associated with that. Simply because you have a bond in place doesn't mean that there is still not a cost of uh, the failure of the contractor in the performance of, the, of that contract or payment to subcontractors. There's still a cost. Just like you mentioned earlier that if you should have to go to mediation or arbitration or court, you know, what is the cost of that? What is the cost of doing business? What is the cost of, of the distraction in your work day, in other work that you're not doing? There is a cost associated um, for um, the failure of that contractor to perform under that contract. So that cost, there's a, there's a, re, a retainage, if you will, um, for, that's one reason. There might be other reasons. Can you think well, of? What's, what kind of uh, some contract would you do? I do uh, demolition and dirt work. Okay. I don't know why there would be a retainage on that one. <laughs> I was going to say if, it's, if you know on, on grassing contracts or landscape pro projects, there is retainage oh, held because once they finish the job. So again, th that goes back to you know, contracting, and if there's a part of the contract that requires a bond and you don't understand why you need that bond associated with the particular contract that you're entering into, then you want to stop and you want to ask and you want to say, why do I need this bond in this situation? It doesn't make sense to me, and have someone look it over and say, well, okay, we don't, we don't need it in this case. and. Um, and then if you want to say, well, that's what, um, that's what uh, so-and-so told me when I was at this conference on um, January 19th, 2013, and I don't want to mention any names, but that's what he said, and so I'm just going to ask you if really uh, I need to have a bond in this case because this doesn't make sense. Can you explain it to me because I don't understand? So I would ask for an, an explanation if you don't understand so that you know whether or not you are going to have, that, have to have that bond. But like I said, a bond can, uh, can certainly hang you up with your, with your project and uh, your, con your contract, okay? Exactly. That's 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 exactly what it is. And and the and uh, a bond to to get that bond from a surety company, um, what you'll see a lot of times is uh, I don't see it as much anymore. Uh, we used to have companies, um, so and so insurance and surety company. Uh, I worked for one of those um, in the past, um, and I was their counsel, their general counsel. Um, uh, many years ago, and but that was the name of the company. It was known as so and so company and surety, so and so insurance and surety company. And so we had that word surety in there. And I don't know if anyone ever knew what the definition of that surety was, and so they dropped it. But sureties are issued by insurance companies, and so you usually go through a broker to get those, and those are underwritten by. Um, by underwriters and the way that works is is that you contact usually a broker if you don't know who a broker is you contact someone that you might think is a broker and uh, a lot of people within ODOT can can steer you that direction and help you with that and they have an application and you fill out the application you send it to them and then they send that application that you've submitted to their underwriters and then their underwriters decide what the cost will be for that bond. In other words, how much money will it cost for uh, for a bond? Um, uh, 
uh, we have different kinds of bonds, like I mentioned earlier. Um, you know, we have the um, the bonds um, to you know to get out of jail bonds. We have for um, court appeals, we have supersedious bonds. And uh, recently, for example, in a court proceeding, um, the uh, the collateral for a bond was going to be 100% of the bond. And this was for a, a well-known company. And so 100%, if the bond was going to be over $400,000, if the bond was going to be less than $250,000, then the collateral required for that bond was going to be 50%. And then there was a cost for the bond. And what was the collateral, you're going to think, what was the collateral going to be for that bond? How, how do you collateralize a bond? Well, the collateral for your home is the home, the bricks and mortar. Collateral for your automobile is the automobile. The collateral for the bond, whether it's 50% or 100%, is generally a letter of credit from your financial institution. And that letter, letter of credit is issued by the financial institution and is issued to the um, to the bonding company or the insurance company for that bond for that amount of the collateral which might be 50 percent in this one case or 100 percent and they have that letter of credit which means that they're going to take that amount of money if it was 50 percent of two hundred thousand dollars they're going to take one hundred thousand dollars and that's what that letter of credit will be and they're going to put back that one hundred thousand dollars and take it and that money is going to be tagged and not able uh, to be released or used until that bond has been exonerated satisfied or released and uh, the uh, it's no longer needed so you might have to have collateral so that's why you know, bond and, and then still pay for the bond so in this case, the bond, the collateral was 50%, and then the bond, I want to say, was for, in this case, it was about $230,000. The bond uh, cost $4,557 for that, for that bond. Okay, so, th so that's what you're talking about when you're getting bonds. The more work you do, the more experience you have, the cost of the bond would go down. The uh, more lack of performance that you show, or the problems that you have, the cost of the bond goes up. Because we're talking about insurance. It's just like having a claim with your auto insurance. The more claims you have, the cost goes higher. The fewer claims, the cost is lower. Okay? Um, let's see. Uh, for federal contracts, payment of bonds is required under the Miller Act of 1935. Uh, most states have little Miller Acts. Mechanic liens cannot be applied to government, governmental property. Payment bonds are the primary payment protection for subcontractors and suppliers on public projects. A claimant with a contract with a supplier or subcontractor, but no contract with Prime, must provide written notice to Prime within 90 days of the date the last labor was um, furnished or material furnished that payment was not received. Subcontractor supplier must wait 90 days from date of the last labor or material to seek payment under the bond. Claimant must file suit seeking payment under the bond within a year from the date the last labor or material for the project was furnished. That one year is what we call or refer to as the statute of limitations. Mechanics liens, monetary protection for providers of labor and material on non-public projects. Public projects are exempt from mechanics liens. Security of a lien on a building or structure to the extent that they have added to its value. That's what a mechanic lien is. A mechanics lien prohibits the sale or transfer of the lien properties until liens are satisfied. And a lien claimant can force the sale of a building or structure to collect debt. Partnering, okay, partnering, kind of know what that is. Uh, a commitment between two or more organizations for the purpose of achieving specific business objectives by maximizing the effectiveness of each participant's resources. I think you know about the partnering process. Partnering outcomes, just go back to this. Um, if you have a partner, partnering agreement, again, um, good agreements make good fences, or good fences in reverse will keep you from having a dispute in your um, 
agreement or with your neighbor or with your party to an agreement and you want to make sure that you are developing this agreement jointly that you have all the same mutual goals uh, again that you're dealing with people of integrity and character that are going to follow through on what they have promised to do their promise to pay or their promise to perform you want to research and see who you're dealing with so you'll know whether or not these people are people of character and integrity and you want to continuously evaluate um, goals um, and you want the timely resolution of your disputes. Um, right now, for example, I have um, a contract that I'm involved with with someone who's doing something for me and, uh, and I want to I don't like that. I don't really like to have anyone doing anything for me because I'm one of these um, uh, individuals who likes to have control over those situations and um, I don't want to have anyone doing anything for me. So when I have to rely on someone, then I want to ensure that they are going to do what they say they're going to do and they're going to perform on this contract as I expect them to perform. So. Um, this, um, in this agreement that I reached with this individual, um, I would decided that I needed a written monthly report on their performance. And uh, that's not in the contract. And, but I wanted it, and I wanted it, uh, I think this contract was signed in October, I wanted it in November, and I, and I received that. And uh, not only did I receive it, it was, um, it was, actually it was far more detailed and far more uh, uh, information than I had anticipated that I would receive, and uh, it, I don't know that anybody had asked for that before, and evidently someone, I wasn't the first, but they were ready for me, and I, I got what I wanted and I was satisfied, but I didn't want to wait so many months and, and not see that I wasn't getting what I wanted. And I wanted to make sure that I was going to see some kind of action on a monthly basis. And so likewise in what we're doing, like in my office, we provide status reports to people that we're working for as far as you know, litigation or when I'm reviewing contracts or if I can do what I'm, I'm, I say that I can do. We, um, at the end of every month, we provide a status report to people on uh, the, you know, the uh, status of a case. At the end of the year, uh, a status report on the status of all cases. Again, um, when you do this, whether you're partnering with another or in this case, if you're entering into a contract, um, you do avoid disputes if you keep up with what's being contracted for. Um, you'll have on-time performance because someone is watching what you're doing and you're reporting what you're doing and you don't want to report that you're doing nothing. So you're going to be doing something so that you can, you can report action and you're going to have improved long-term relationships and again as we talked about much earlier fair profit and prompt payment for the contractor. Um, performance bond claims, they are primarily for the protection uh, for the owners and the prime contractors, for subcontractors. The performance bonds ensure that the project will be completed. Performance bonds are not dispute, re re dispute resolution mechanisms. Let me say that again. Performance bonds are not dispute resolution mechanisms. Dispute resolution mechanisms are alternative dispute resolution that we talked about earlier, also known as ADR. That would be mediation or arbitration. So that's not what a performance bond is. A performance bond is more associated with an insurance policy written by an insurance company. Um, you, um, the first step is you terminate the bonded contract. You might have a pre-termination meeting to discuss the methods to perform. Uh, the owner obligee can give 15 day notice to take over completion of a project if the surety does not act with reasonable promptness and like I said before reasonable is that reasonable man approach what do we think is reasonable options under a performance bond finance the contractor take over the work tender a new contractor elect not to complete the work clear as mud uh, no, uh, the performance bond is required, and I think that, um, as I mentioned before, if you are 
working and you're dealing in your business uh, activities with um, the integrity and the character that you expect from others, then you're not going to have a problem with your bonds. Initially, it may be more difficult to obtain those bonds, but when you're working to get these contracts and you're working to start businesses and you're working to get that first contract, don't forget the performance bonds, um, payment bonds, don't forget the bonds that you're going to need and work on those as early as you are working on assembling your team so that you will have all of that ready when you need it because the turnaround time on some of these contracts may be very very brief, um, as I mentioned, and or you might have more time, but regardless, the bond's going to be needed and you're going to have to have that, so you're going to want to be ready and and I am a very proactive individual. I want to know, you know, aside from dotting all those I's and crossing all those T's, I need to know what the I's and the T's are before I can cross the T's or dot the I's. I have to know what I'm doing and what I'm going to need to be doing before it's required of me. So you don't want to be caught off guard and caught by surprise um, in not having all your ducks in a row so that you're ready to perform. Um, if you should ever have any questions, uh, you have a great group of people here um, at ODOT that can help you um, with any question that you have. And um, certainly if you had any questions um, from me, you could call and I would answer any questions that you have. And then if I didn't know the answer, I would call someone at ODOT and I would go to uh, uh, my, you know, to, to someone and I might ask uh, a question and someone might direct me. Um, I work with a lot of state agencies and um, my husband is a director of a state agency and he has a lot of attorneys that phone him. He's an attorney and he answers their questions and, and tells them where to go and where to get the answers um, uh, so that they don't uh, have to hire an attorney, you don't want to hire an attorney, certainly you don't want to get to that stage and you can do it best by knowing uh, the requirements of the contracts that you're entering into, reading the contracts. If you don't like something in the contract, question the contract and and really um, don't be afraid uh, to to line out, line item, go through that contract. Uh, I've done it, I've done it many times on contracts and um, I have uh, handled cases in so many different arenas including um, in two, military, representing mili the military in military individuals and I have had, uh, I've had orders from the military and I've rejected those orders and I've worked with generals and I have rejected um, orders that have been written by generals and I have also put clauses in orders that, uh, that they might enter this order in, say for example, a clause, but that it would not go into a military individual's personnel file. And I uh, don't think of these things, I think, of, I think outside the box and I don't want harm to befall uh, an employer that I represent, or in this case, uh, there's a military member, uh, other military issues that I've been involved in. So, so from the whole gamut of what you think you can do or what you think you can't do, again, as I said from the beginning, if you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. But if you think you can, most, most often I think you will and I see just nothing but success for everyone in this room uh, both at ODOT and the individuals that are here that are trying to learn from this um, presentation and I hope that you take away something with you today that will give you that impetus to move forward and to get those contracts that you want and with that the safeguards of the contracts and the performance bonds and then understanding uh, the way the law works and uh, mediation and arbitration and uh, the attorney is uh, the last resort but uh, sometimes uh, getting the advice or seeking the advice of an attorney just um, an hour of that attorney's time may be well worth it for you and uh, may save you a lot of money in the long run and so you can assemble your team and be ready to go to business when you get that first contract and I thank you very much thank you